Um, okay, so thanks everyone for joining us today. Um, I'm Allison Barnes. I'm an NSF PGRP postdoc at North Carolina State University, uh, where I work with Ruben Rayan Alvarez on um, understanding how maize adapted to highland conditions through lipid biochemistry. Um, today, we're going to be talking about postdoctoral fellowships and beyond. Uh, so we have three great guests with us today, and then um, we'll give everyone a little bit of time to introduce themselves, our three panelists, and then uh, we'll just jump right into a question and answer session. So today we have Kevin Cox, who's an HHMI Hannah Gray Fellow um, in the Blake Myers Lab at Donald Danforth Plant Science Center. We have Tetsuya Nabori, who's an HFSP Fellow in the Ecker Lab at Salk Institute. And we have Diane Okamura, who's a Program Director for PGRP at the NSF. So um, Kevin, if you wanna start, we'll just give, oh, sorry, before we get started, Sandra needs to introduce plant postdocs who we are and what we do. And actually, before we do that, I just want to um, let everyone know that it's National Postdoc Appreciation Week. Um, so there are a lot of events going on virtually. If you go to nationalpostdoc.org, there are um, different uh, links to register for virtual events. So please go check that out. Okay, Sandra, sorry, go ahead and introduce plant postdocs now. Hi everyone, my name is Sandra Hofberg and I'm a postdoc in the lab of Darren Eaton at Columbia University studying phylogenetics and hybridization in the genus Amaranthus. I'm the internal communication chair of plant postdocs and I want to take a few minutes to introduce our group, group and the activities we are doing. Plant postdocs started with the conversation between postdocs when they realized that every postdoc position is temporary and we are constantly on the lookout for a more permanent job. Arif and Sunil created a community for postdocs in the plant sciences so we can discuss, explore, and support each other as we prepare for our future career path in academia or industry. Plant Postdocs is two years old and we have a leadership team consisting of the chair, Arif Ashraf, the vice chair, Allison Barnes, and the internal communications chair, myself. We are looking for postdocs to join us in leading this organization and making a difference in the academic career of our peers. If you're interested in a leadership position and building connections with plant scientists, please contact us for more information. Plant Postdocs has a faculty advisory board consisting of Aaron Sparks, Gabriella Auhe, Rob Last, Arjun Krishnan, and Sunil Kenchampane Raju. Plant Postdocs has a Slack group to chat about job opportunities, the application process, interviews, etc., with over 320 members. We have an official website, plantpostdocs.com, and Twitter account where we post job ads and our programming. We have over 4,600 followers on Twitter. We've initiated the Potential Plant Peer Reviewer Database, 3PRD, to help early career researchers to gain experience as reviewers. This has been distributed to editors of plant science-related journals. We will update this list in the coming months. And for more formal peer review training, we are starting a partnership with pre-review. So be on the lookout for that. We hold monthly seminars where two postdocs can share their research in a 20 minute talk. Our next seminar will be on September 28th at noon Eastern time. Join us to hear talks about crop wild relatives. We've also written an open letter to departmental seminar series organizers promoting the inclusion of early career researchers, which you can find on Twitter, and add your name to a list of postdocs willing to give seminars. We hold a weekly writing accountability group where we get together on Zoom, set writing goals, and work independently for an hour. And this is our seventh webinar, today focusing on postdoctoral fellowships. We organize two webinars each semester. They're all recorded and available on our YouTube channel. In the past, we have had webinars on academic jobs, industry jobs, and science writing, editing, and reviewing. We're always looking to create webinars that are of interest to our attendees. So you, if you have an idea for, for a webinar you'd like to see, please email us. And lastly, we're planning other activities and resources. And if you'd like to get involved to help plan anything, please reach out to the leadership team. 
For information on how to join plant postdocs, please visit plantpostdocs.com. And I want to thank you all for joining us today. Um, and now we can get started with our panelists. Yeah, sorry about that. Okay, now we can do our panelists introductions. Um, so Kevin, if you want to just take like three to five minutes, tell us a little bit about your science journey, um, how you came to know about and apply for your fellowship, and then one piece of advice that you would give to everyone who is working on fellowship writing. Uh, sure. So I'm Kevin Copps. I'm a postdoc at the Donald Danforth Plant Science Center. I work in Blake Myers lab. Um, so my journey, it starts off as uh, I did my PhD work in, at Texas A&M University and Dr. Lebo Shen's lab, where I study bacterial blattocotton and study its molecular mechanisms. Um, towards the end of my PhD studies, I was looking for labs or looking for postdoc labs. And I bumped into Blake Myers, who's my current postdoc advisor, post advisor at a conference. And we kind of hit it off. And next thing you know, I joined his lab. And what had happened was how I came across the uh, HHMI fellowship was I was referred to it, I think the first year that it was out, but I wasn't eligible for it by a collaborator uh, because he mentioned to me like, hey, this is a great, opportunity for underrepresented uh, scientists and you would be eligible for this so you should look out for this and so when I was getting ready to graduate or uh, when I knew I became eligible for it I went ahead and applied for it and it took me two tries but I ended up getting it on a second try and I guess the biggest advice that I would give about applying for these fellowship is most of the time it's kind of good to have like a good mentor set in mind. Um, try to find somebody that you can mesh with early so that we can get like good recommendation letters or help on your proposals. Um, that's probably been the best thing for me because since I found Blake Myers early and I kind of agreed to join his lab early, um, we were able to like work on some proposals together and hash out some ideas. So. Awesome, thank you. Okay, Tatsaya, we will um, move to you if you want to answer just the same question. Sure. Um, hi, everyone. <clears throat> I'm Tatsaya from uh, Sophie Institute in San Diego. I'm studying plant microbe interactions, as Kevin does, I think. And um, uh, my first experience with HFSP uh, was, I think, many years ago when I was a first year PhD student at, uh, in Germany at the Max Planck Institute. There, uh, my um, colleague postdocs talked about this fellowship and they said it's a very good one. So I was curious enough and um, downloaded the application guidelines uh, from the website and read those. And I was totally overwhelmed because um, what I got from my reading uh, at that time was that if you want a fellowship, you need to be extremely successful during your PhD and you need to manage to get into a um, uh, top lab in the world, whatever it means. And, and your research plan needs to be, I'll actually reading what's written there. So your research plan needs to be innovative, original, risky, groundbreaking at the leading edge of the life sciences and a trailblazer for future discoveries and et cetera, et cetera. So that was just too much for a naive first year PhD student. Um, but I, I do encourage you to read those application guidelines as early as possible, um, even if you are a PhD student or undergrads, because although initially I was overwhelmed, um, gradually I got motivated. So it helped me set the bar high up, uh, which kind of helped me keep going during my PhD. And also, um, and now I know that you don't need to be perfect to get a fellowship. It's relative evaluation. So you need to score a little higher than a certain number of people who, who actually applied. And, and so not everybody is applying for the same fellowship in the same year, uh, especially HFSP has a very strict and a little tricky eligibility criteria, uh, which I may or may not touch upon later. So, um, so my point is don't be too intimidated by um, what's written in the application guidelines uh, like it was. And, I hope uh, reading this um, 
you know, gives you some motivation. And so, so in some pra practical advice in writing fellowship um, to HFSP specifically is to show that, uh, well, actually I have three points, not one, but first, uh, it's your project, not your PIs. Uh, second, you have a clear vision about your goals, not only short-term goals during your postdoc or like a fellowship period, but also long-term goals, like how your postdoc project and also postdoc training in, in the host lab can help you build your own career in the future. Uh, and third, um, so try your best to propose some uh, attractive uh, research plan uh, which should be a nice blend of your own expertise and your host lab's expertise. So whether you can do the same project in other labs or whether the host lab can do the same thing without you, then these are kind of questions you need to ask yourself. And if you have a clear vision and nice research, I mean, the attractive research plan, I think the feasibility of your research plan might not be as good, as important as it is for like research grants or other maybe other fellowships because HFSP uh, encourages you to tackle some risky projects. So they, they are aware of risks. So uh, yeah, so these are uh, my piece of advice. Awesome, thank you. Okay, so Diane, your role is a little bit different since you're a program director um, and yes. not a postdoc who's on a fellowship. <laughs> So maybe you can um, explain to us some of these finer points of applying and also still we I think would be interested to know and how you became a program director and what sort of um, qualifications are needed for helping run all of these grant programs. So, um, well, thank you for inviting me to join with all of you. Uh, I love getting these opportunities to talk with uh, postdocs and answer your questions about our postdoctoral fellowship programs. So um, I have been a program director for over 16 years at the National Science Foundation. Um, I, my, my journey there was uh, I was a, uh, got a PhD in biology from uh, UCLA. I went to uh, the pre-University of Ghent for my postdoctoral work in plant transformation and uh, regulation of gene expression. Um, I was a research faculty at UC Santa Cruz for, for many years, and then I transitioned to com a company, a, a startup company that was focusing on Arabidopsis functional genomics in the late 1990s. Uh, it was from there that I was approached by individuals that I knew at the National Science Foundation. They heard that I might be interested in leaving the company and so they reached out to me. I have to say that um, the first thing I said to them was, uh, what makes you think I can do that job? <laughs> uh, so um, they just said, please don't say no yet. <laughs> think about it. And I did, I, I decided to uh, try it out. It was just a rotator's position, which are uh, positions that are short term between one, two, three years. And I thought that it would be a great way to serve, give back to the foundation which had supported me throughout the years, including uh, a postdoctoral fellowship, the NATO NSF postdoctoral fellowship. So uh, would you like to know more about being a program director, or would you like to know a little bit about the uh, postdoctoral fellowship program now? Uh, either one is fine. We have plenty of time, so we can eventually okay. hit both. Okay. Um, so uh, I have to say, I should have put this up as my background. Uh, the National Science Foundation was uh, uh, ranked as number five as one of the best places to work in the federal government. And uh, the biology, biological sciences directorate of which I am a member uh, ranked number one <laughs> in, in, in bio and so uh, in at NSF. And so uh, program directors, um, they are required to have at least six years of experience in managing uh, and, uh, research. Uh, a research lab. 
Um, and it helps to be fairly broad, although many of the programs, well, it helped me to be very broad because I was going into a program called the Plant Genome Research Program. And it was much more broad. It actually covered almost all of biology, plant biology, except that it was really on a, uh, a different scale. It was on a genome-wide scale, and uh, the uh, program also included uh, the funding uh, and support of tool development, resource development. So this was the program. It is going to be 25 years old next year. It's our 25th anniversary. It, um, we funded the, uh, uh, the support of sequencing projects. Uh, the uh, high throughput phenotyping tools, mutant collections, um, and others. And, and also we support uh, basic hypothesis driven research on a genome wide scale. So um, I would, I, I think that the first thing that would be a, a, a to just get, let you know what it's like to do this job is to be a reviewer for us review a proposal for us. And we do send out requests for reviews to postdocs. Um, and uh, all it takes is for you to contact a program officer and provide us with a, your CV. And that's all it takes. Um, once you are a um, uh, review for us, you then become eligible to be on a panel. And there you'll find the um, exactly what we do uh, to manage panels and to manage uh, the uh, proposal reviews and making funding recommendations. You should know, though, program directors are not that powerful at NSF. We, <laughs> we do not make decisions about funding. Uh, um, but no, sort of doesn't compute to most PIs. We can only recommend. It is the NSF and all of the senior managers above me who uh, approve and make the award. So I have input, but I'm not that powerful. I can't just say make it so and it and, and it uh, happens. So and I guess I I would just encourage you since this is a plant biology postdoc group that um, I want to encourage you uh, because uh, NSF provides a lot of support to plant biology, not only in the biological sciences directorate and in every division of the biological sciences directorate, but also throughout the foundation in engineering, in mathematics, in chemistry. It is quite amazing how much money goes to the plant biology community. And so when you're considering uh, putting in a fellowship application at NSF uh, in the Biological Sciences Directorate, know that all three competitive areas uh, accept proposals in plant biology. There are just some uh, different specifications and requirements for each of the competitive areas. And I can go over that a little bit more later. Awesome, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so here's the point now where our um, attendees get to have some say. Uh, you can either post your questions into the chat and I'm happy to read them out, um, or you can raise your hand and unmute yourself um, if you have a question there. I don't have any questions in the chat yet, but we did get emailed one um, asking about opportunities for fellowships if you're not an American citizen, um, because there are some so, some tricky rules and regulations there. If any of you have um, advice about that. So I know. I know at least with HHMI, uh, for their, for their postdoctoral fellowship, um, you don't have to be an American citizen. Um, you just have to be, you just have to do your, uh, 
PhD in a lab in the US and then do a postdoc in the US. And I think that alone makes you eligible for it unless they changed it. Um, mm -hmm. But when I had a, when I had applied two years ago, that's what the requirement was, was you just had to be uh, in a PhD lab in the US and do a postdoc in the US. So HFSP actually requires the opposite. Uh, you have to change countries uh, between PhD and postdocs. So you can't be, I think more specifically, you can't be in the host postdoc host country for more than one year uh, when you start the, as HFSP fellow. So that's a tricky part. So if you are, if you are an American studying in the US, you need to go abroad. Uh, somewhere outside the US uh, to get a fellowship. And also importantly, in, you know, this one year rule counts any kind of research activity. So if you do uh, like a short term internship in Europe or, you know, half a year stay in a collaborator's lab in Europe and you want to stay in the country, you need to be careful because if you stay for more than one year, you are not, il not eligible anymore in that uh, particular country. And um, unfortunately, it is the, the federal fellowship programs that require uh, uh, that the applicants are, are either a U.S. citizen or a permanent resident of the U.S. And that's because for most of the fellowships, we actually provide the funding directly to the fellow. It is not given to the institution. It is given to the fellow which is great for the fellows because that means that the fellowship is portable and you can, you know, um, be, it's, you're very flexible. You can go wherever you'd like, basically, as long as you tell us where you're going uh, and why. Um, and, uh, but it is difficult for those individuals who are not uh, eligible. Uh, we have another question in the chat here about, um, applying to postdocs in the US. Um, maybe, I'm not sure, Nazir, if you would like to elaborate, but maybe um, you can talk about finding your postdoc. Uh, Tatsaya, I know you you just said you had to move countries. Um, so how do you go about finding an advisor um, to sponsor you uh, to be your manager for applying to some of these fellowships? Uh, so was it a question to me? Uh, uh, sure, yeah. Or everyone, uh, anyone on the panel can uh, answer, but yeah, okay. we'll start with you. All right. Uh, so, so how I can? So let's say I'll talk about how I found my uh, PhD. Uh, sorry, the postdoc supervisor. Um, so basically, I didn't have any connection with my current PI, uh, Joe, but uh, I just simply study from what I want to do, uh, what I want to, you know, study in the postdoc, because I studied uh, plant microbe interaction during my PhD and wanted to apply some single cell genomics and epigenomics techniques uh, for, uh, you know, to get a deeper understanding of the plant microbe interactions. And then when I uh, thought about uh, my postdoc labs, there was no papers on single cell RNA seq or whatever in plants. So I had no idea where can I do this. And but I know that Joe published some single cell epigenome papers in, in mouse brains, not plants. But I thought maybe yeah he can accommodate such uh, logics of single cell plant uh, biology. So I just emailed him and uh, luckily I got a position. And uh, what really helped me was Joe let me in the lab without a fellowship. So he supported my first year. And, and as Kevin mentioned, that helped me uh, build my own uh, research project for HFSP. Uh, um, so I think, it, yeah, um, it's not an um, advice for how, how I found the postdoc fellowship, but um, I think if, if possible, it's nice if you can join the lab before uh, applying for the, your postdoc uh, fellowship. Yeah, I had to. Pretty much agree with that. Um, so I had found Blake uh, through a conference and we had network and decided that we were a good fit for each other. Um, obviously I understand COVID put a damper 
on that as far as like networking and co networking co at conferences in person. Um, but that's actually one avenue is that you do figure out what lab that you want to work in or what area you want to work in, like uh, Tetsuya was saying. And uh, you try to just either ask a professor or email some of the professors that you're interested in if, and if there are any openings. Um, another way that you could go about it is just ask your advisor. Just like your, advi your PhD advisor likely knows more people um, than you do and can point you into the right direction. Like what's a good lab for you or what's a good fit for you or what will be a good mentor. Um, but yeah, it's, I think it's definitely important that you find your postdoc advisor first before you start applying for fellowships if possible. Because um, because it's, it's easier for you to come up with proposals and like get feedback from your postdoctoral advisor versus trying to come up with this project by yourself and you don't know where you're gonna go still. Um, so yeah, finally your mentor first will be <laughs> ideal. And I so for my that. Oh, okay. sorry, go ahead, Diane. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to uh, uh, sort of uh, agree with Kevin that it is very important uh, to think about who your mentor is going to be because your mentor, just like your PhD advisor, will be someone, hopefully, who will be in your, in your corner for the rest of your career. They will be looking out for you just as they have Mine have been looking out for me. Those individuals who reached out to me uh, to become an NSF uh, program director, they were watching me the whole time and I had no clue, <laughs> none. And so uh, for the uh, bio, uh, NSF fellowships, it is important to uh, highlight that the mentors actually have to provide a sponsoring scientist statement and they have to provide a customized mentoring plan for uh, the postdoc. And that's because this, uh, our fellowships are about the postdocs themselves. It's not just about their research. It's about what their career goals are, what kind of training they're going to need in order to achieve those goals. And so we really want to know um, that you are going to be supported at your uh, at your mentor's uh, institution. Yeah, and I was just gonna add too that, um, so I'm on the, the NSF postdoc fellowship. I actually have three um, faculty members who are my sort of my co-mentors. So I have my like my main supervisor um, who is whose lab I joined as a postdoc for six months before I submitted my application um, for my NSF um, fellowship. But I would say that um, something I would encourage is to try to find those diverse groups of people. Um, it really helps in getting different points of view when you're writing the fellowship and also gives you um, broader support. Um, so for example, like I said, I focus on maize, but one of my co-mentors works in yeast because I wanted to use yeast as a heterologous system. So having those sort of different points of view can be really helpful when you're writing and when you're um, actually going through and doing the, the experiment. Um, okay, our next question um, is, how do you think these fellowships help you um, to help to support you for future PI positions? And anybody can take it. I'm not gonna direct that one at anybody. Um. Yeah, with mine, um, my, with mine, it helps me relatively well because, uh, so besides the fact that um, I guess it provides you with like an extra, uh, what's the word I'm trying to say? I guess credential that's, hey, I got this fellowship. I wrote a proposal and I went through a competition and I got it. Um, that's something good to put on your CV and people that are reviewing for a faculty position, they take note of that. Because uh, that shows that you can write your own projects and come up with your own ideas and carry them out. Um, so besides that, uh, I know with my particular fellowship, it also comes with a startup funding with it. So that kind of makes me attractive to 
other labs because I also carried a startup funding for S amount of years uh, when I joined a uh, faculty position. Um, but I, I would say like the biggest thing is that it kind of shows, it's something great to put on your CV because it shows that you can write proposals on your own and carry out projects on your own. And that you're also willing to, I guess, accept uh, rejection letters because you probably had to apply for quite a few fellowships to get that postdoc mm -hmm. proposal. So I haven't been on a, a faculty panel, but I'm assuming they take note of that when they're reviewing their uh, candidates. So uh, HFSB, I think used to have a so-called career development award, which is a research grant. Only uh, HFSB uh, fellowship awardees are eligible to apply, but it might not exist anymore. I, at least I didn't find the information yesterday when, when I Googled yesterday. Um, so, but what I think might be helpful um, in a future career would be, you know, the application process was already quite helpful. As I said at the beginning, you need, you know, you should propose uh, something. Um, it's your project and you need to make your vision clear. Uh, these are definitely important to, you know, be a faculty in the future um, uh, to, you know, establish your own lab. And also what I like about HFSP is, the, is its community. So it involves uh, not only long postdoctoral long-term fellows, but also there's another postdoctoral fellowship called cross, how it's called, cross-disciplinary fellowship that supports, uh, you know, people that made very dramatic transition, like who studied, uh, those who studied in physics, mathematics, chemistry in, your, in their PhD and turning to biology field or something like that. So, so connecting with those diverse people really helps me uh, broaden my, my vision and also they can be a good collaborator of mine in the future in, in, you know, in, in my own lab. So uh, I think that, that can be a, a big plus. Um, and I think that uh, part of being a, a fellow with one of these programs provides you with an inherent networking cohort that you can um, tap into. And it actually helps you uh, in many different ways, not, not just you know, in terms of, of uh, uh, you know, um, there's your support group. And, and I think that uh, at least for our fellows, uh, I have seen such networking it is quite amazing. They have published together uh, as as groups, um, they have brought their mentors into their research and had them be uh, now collaborators. And uh, you know, it, I estimate how many of the fellows have gotten jobs since the uh, the area three, which is the plant genome research fellowships. If I if I sort of estimate that, I think it's close to seventy percent have gotten jobs either in industry, academia, or in, not, in nonprofits. So it's quite extensive. Okay, our next question is, um, once you got your fellowship or once you get a fellowship, what makes you successful at this fellowship? Are you doing anything differently um, than you did to make you a successful graduate student? Can you repeat the question one more time? I'm trying to process it. <laughs> yep, no problem. Um, okay, so once you have your fellowship, what makes you successful? Are you doing anything differently than you did to make you a successful graduate student now to be a successful postdoc with a fellowship? I would say no, because the reason you got that fellowship is based off what your graduate work is um, or what you did in your graduate work. And you're basically kind of carry on that momentum that you did, took for graduate school and kind of just, uh, you kind of do like doing more with it because you're a more independent thinker than you were a graduate student because most of the time when you were a graduate student you probably 
lean on your advisor a whole lot more than your post out. Um, but other than that, like the skill sets, like I say, you have kind of have it already because you get these post outs based on what your graduate work or what you did in graduate school. So that may that's my opinion. I don't know if that's the right answer, but yeah. <laughs> Well, I, I echo Kevin's point and I will do, you know, basically the same, but I also changed um, quite a bit of my mindset when I joined the postdoc club because, you know, um, in my lab, um, more than half of people are not plant biologists, they are neuroscientists or bioinformaticians or technologists and interacting with them really, really, um, you know, broaden my perspective and also my PI always, uh, brought us with new ideas, new opportunities, and, and which made me more ambitious than I used to be and also willing to take risks. So because I feel secured in the lab, so my PI created, creates the environment that, you know, where I can feel like I don't have to leave in two years or three years, you know, once my postdoc, uh, postdoc fellowship ends. So I don't need to jump onto some easy projects with, you know, for quick publication, but I can focus on, you know, what we really want to do, um, no matter how challenging it might be. So um, that's what, what I'm really grateful and, and enjoying right now. Yeah, I would definitely agree with that. I think that um, having, knowing you have that set amount of time allows you to maybe be a little bit riskier in some projects or just take some chances that maybe, at least for me personally, I probably wouldn't have taken on experiments as a graduate student. Um, and, and sort of, and, and then you kind of like, you never know where it's gonna lead. It might, being able to take those risks gives you a lot more opportunities scientifically. Um, our next question is, how influential is your publication record from your PhD? in getting a postdoctoral fellowship? Well, I think it, it is important, but it's not the only um, kind of factor um, to be a successful applicant. So HFSP says you, you need at least one first author publication, um, but that's it. And, and I didn't have that strong publication record when I uh, applied. I had one uh, first author paper and some co author papers at that time, but that's just one first author paper. So, but yeah, I think um, um, for HFSP specifically, more important is you have a, as uh, I, I just repeat myself, but you know, you have a clear vision of your goals in the future. So, what really want to achieve in the future? And maybe recommendation letters are more important because this supports um, that you can handle those like, you know, risky or out of your field research. Um, uh, yeah, in, in your postdoc period. Yeah, I have to agree with that. Uh, definitely the vision. They wanted to know what kind of vision that you have uh, for your postdoc. So that's, I think that's pretty important. Um, having a publication, like your trap record, that looks, it does help a lot. Like, I'm not going to deny that. Like, it definitely does help to show that, hey, I actually wrote a paper, I actually have some research published, um, and this is it. You can look at it. Um, it helps because they get, they have something to, to uh, kind of, it gives them like an extra material to look at your work. Um, so for the HHMI fellowship, uh, one of the requirements is if you get into the later stages, um, you have to present like, I think it's like half on your PhD work and a half on your postdoc proposal work <laughs> because they're assuming that you gather enough data or have enough data from your PhD work to tell a story, uh, whether that's published or not. Um, I mean, my publication record wasn't that stellar. I mean, I have one first author, and one, one first author that was a review, that was a research article, and then one first author that was a review article. Uh, by the time I graduated, along with maybe two other co-author papers. But it's not the only thing that they look at. 
like was like what was uh, mentioned earlier. So it's important, but no, that's not a limiting factor. And I can say from a different point of view, listening to the reviewers who are commenting on your applications, it is the whole package. There are many factors and they are trying to figure out whether you will be successful at attaining your career goals with your mentor if you get the fellowship. So that's what they're doing. And it's not always just dean counting and seeing how many papers you have or things like that. It, you, it is the whole package, you. They are looking to understand what you want to do and whether you will be one of that next generation of plant biologists who are going to be responsible for training the next generation in any capacity. That means you don't have to go into academics. There's many ways to train the next generation. So. Uh, we had a question about international applications um, other than the HFSP. So I'll just encourage maybe everyone from our group, if you know of a, of a fellowship to post that there in the chat. I see Kevin um, responded with one, uh, the Life Sciences Research Foundation Fellowship. Um, and then we'll move on to our, our next question. Um, how do you like having a post this postdoctoral fellowship? And do you feel that your position is quite different from your previous PhD or postdoc position? I mean, I, I like it a lot, like having my fellowship. Um, it gives me so many opportunities as far as uh, giving me, uh, like, I think it's like up to four years of funding for my postdoc. And then if I were to start my own faculty position, it gives me up to four years of startup funding. So I like it a lot. It gives me more flexibility to, like what was said, like what was said earlier, to take risks and to uh, kind of, let my mind run, run wild to an extent. Um, and then it also kind of gave me a little bit more of, uh, I guess, recognition that I probably would have gotten had I not gotten this fellowship. Um, and then what was the second part of that question? Um, sorry, got to go back to it. Oh, um, how do you feel your position is different from your previous from being a PhD student or any previous postdoc position? Yeah, I say it's different because I'm less uh, dependent on my advisor. Uh, so for my PhD, during my PhD uh, studies, I had to kind of have my, had to have my advisor hold my hand throughout my entire process to figure out what steps to take next or what route do I want to go and whatnot, whether, me as a postdoc right now, I tend to be a little bit more independent. Uh, I tend to take on or develop projects on my own and go after it that way. And I just kind of bring them to my advice of like, hey, this is what I was thinking about doing. Like, what do you think about this? What's your feedback? Um, so that's kind of been the fun part about being a postdoc is just kind of just, uh, I get to like, be more of an independent thinker than I was like a PhD student. Um, yeah, I also like my fellowship a lot. Um, as I said, um, I like the community of HFSP. Uh, I had my first annual meeting uh, this year. Unfortunately, it was held virtually. You used to be in person, um, but I was really inspired by all the presentation, you know, again, from those people from very different uh, research fields. Um, but I don't think in, the, in my lab, I don't think um, having this fellowship doesn't make any difference. Even without a fellowship, I think I can enjoy, you know, what I enjoy in, in my lab right now. And so, so what's different in, in postdoc compared with my PhD is, yeah, I think as, as Kevin mentioned, the independence, because in during my PhD, I had one-on-one uh, -on -one meeting with my advisor every week, like an hour or two every week. And, but now I, I have you know, much uh, less frequent uh, like 
face-to-face -face, uh, discussion. Although I always shoot some emails, you know, whenever I come up with some something, I, I want the guidance from my uh, PI. But yeah, so basically, I'm more independent. I, I I take responsibilities to my my project. That's I think a big difference. All right, next question. Um, do you think having um, bio archive and preprints is helpful during um, fellowship applications? Yeah, HFSP uh, does allow you to put preprint uh, in, your, in your application. So I think it helps. I will also agree with that, that it definitely helps. Uh, because again, it gives your it gives the panels or the reviewers something to look at. Um, whether it may not be uh, peer review yet, um, the fact that you have something in the works and something on paper that they can basically pull up and see what you wrote and what you gather, it it helps you. It's only going to benefit you. Um, how far in advance of graduating uh, with your PhD did you start looking for postdoc opportunities? And I'm going to just adding on to that, how far in advance can you start applying for these fellowships? I, I think um, I had been thinking about my postdoc project, um, even when I was a first year PhD student. And that sounds a little silly, but I, I was. I, I, and I even thought that, you know, moving outside of the plant biology field. So I read many papers in, in you know, other fields like medical fields, and which actually helped me, you know, um, uh, broaden my knowledge and also perspectives. Uh, but I think, it, um, so I decided uh, on my, you know, postdoc project, like, as I said, single cell genomics, epigenomics, I think about one year before I, uh, I got my PhD. And then I started applying um, for postdoc positions. Uh, so uh, that, at that time, so one year before getting PhD and the, uh, my current lab is the only lab I send an email. So I was very lucky to get a position. Um, and so the second part is, oh, so the how far in advance I can apply for the fellowship. Um, I'm not quite sure, but I think about one year before maximum, I think before getting PhD, but I'm not quite sure. Yeah, um, I think, when I was looking for postdocs, I started to um, look about two years before I graduated. Um, Cause at that time I was giving myself like a little buffer to, cause I was kind of basically hearing horror stories where like, oh, I can't find a postdoc positions or, oh, I'm getting ready to graduate but I don't have a lab lined up after work. So normally the advice that I've gotten was like, look for a postdoc roughly two to one and a half years that you're getting ready to graduate. Uh, that's a good time to start looking for a lab. Um, as far as postdoc awards, I think a year before you graduate uh, or, or a year before you start your postdoc is the earliest. And I say that, and maybe Diane, she can uh, chime in on this, um, that there's a limit where you get the, like the award uh, accepted that you have to start. So I mean, like after they give you the award, you have to start it by, this date. And usually that's like within a year, but maybe Diane, she can comment on that. Yeah, it depends. It depends. I thought that initially I thought that there was some time uh, frame that, uh, that you had to start your fellowship. But in fact, the National Science Foundation doesn't really uh, track that. Uh, your award is actually made before you start your fellowship many in many cases it, the start date of your award is not generally the start date of your fellowship so we have had individuals start their fellowship 
as late as uh, a year after uh, they heard that they were going to get funded. So let's say in June of each year. And some have actually asked for a little bit longer because the pandemic has affected their abilities to graduate. So uh, we're being trying to be flexible now uh, at the at the uh, agency. I would just add on to that that um, just a piece of advice I got from former fellows is that if you have a flexible start date to consider when to start that, like basically where will your end date be in the job cycle? Um, so for example, if your fellowship ends in June, um, maybe harder to, to get a position to start, like you'd have to find a position that starts in August. Uh, so for example, instead of you can delay it until January or something like that, it might give you a little bit more time uh, to, to find a position to get started for what that's worth. Oh, um, I have uh, one, one piece of advice on uh, applying for HFSB. Uh, so I, I would recommend, as I said, you know, applying for the fellowship after you join the lab. But if you do so, um, the best timing to apply your post lab is in April and only April, because uh, you, can't be, you can't be in the host lab for more than one year. Um, at the time of fellowship activation. And the earliest timing you can activate your fellowship is April 1st, which means if you join the lab before April 1st, you can no longer apply for the fellowship in, in this lab. And so it so should be after April. And now we have a pre-screen, HFSB has a pre-screening, um, I think at the, at, the, at the end of May. So, so you should be in the lab between April and May. And if you want to maximize the time, you know, in, in the host lab, it should be, if you should join the lab early April, maybe. So if it might not be so helpful, but if you have a flexibility, yeah, I should definitely recommend to do so. Um, I also uh, would like to emphasize, and, and I think that this is a very good point, is that all fellowships have requirements for eligibility uh, deadlines that are different from other fellowship uh, uh, programs. And so it's very important, number one, to read the solicitation or the call for proposals, because there you'll find what you need to do uh, to apply. And two, contact your program officer. They are there, it's their job. <laughs> to answer your questions, no matter how many questions that is, it is our job to help you uh, navigate through the the application process. So we are not scary, really. We don't bite. <laughs> I think that we have time for one more uh, question um, before we hit our our noon uh, time here. I'm going to direct this one to Diane, and then um, if our other panelists want to jump in later with their own personal experience, you can add in there. Um, but we have a question that I think is really important about how your postdoc advisor's career stage impacts your fellowship application chances. So this person says their, their advisor is an assistant professor, um, but would a later stage co-sponsor increase the chances of their application being successful? So. We have, we try not to allow reviewers to, or panelists to, uh, in, uh, to introduce implicit bias. And there, that is a, a bias against assistant professors <laughs> that they don't have the, the necessary training. Um, but they were probably most uh, closest to being a postdoc than uh, other faculty members. And remember, this is about you and uh, your mentor is part of the team that's going to help you become successful. And so uh, sometimes uh, what I've seen is, is a very, um, it's seen very positively is when the mentor actually 
in their sponsoring scientist statement actually comes up and says, you know, I am an assistant professor and I too have mentors at my institution. And those individuals will be available to the applicant as a mentor as well. So it can, it can be, it can be uh, um, portrayed as something very positive. And, and there again, I think if you contact your program officer, you can um, uh, better understand how to present your case. Yeah, I know. I have to agree. I have to agree with that. Um, I know for HHMI, like it doesn't matter what stage uh, your postdoc your postdoc advisor would be. Um, what only ma what really matters is if they support you, they're in your corner, and if they are will will be able to help you to uh, guide you through your projects. Um, those are pretty much like the only big things. But as far as like career stage, assistant, associate, or um, full professor, like that, that doesn't really matter. Yeah, same for HFSP. I think you don't score higher only because you are in a big lab. Um, but I think it might affect because, you know, those established labs likely have the capacity to accommodate sort of HFSP like projects, you know, some risks and not not the you know uh, main topic of the lab. So if you know in a in a very in a lab of younger PI who just became a PI, it might be difficult to do some work on project that's very different from you know their main uh, uh, focus. But you can always start to you know talk with them early uh, as early as possible so that so you know so you can come up with a nice uh, idea for for projects. Okay, so we're up against the end of our webinar here, um, but I just wanted to give our panelists all a moment or two for any final thoughts or pieces of wisdom or advice. Um, I guess the biggest thing, find a mentor that has your back, um, that you know is gonna support you uh, and gonna help you through whatever project you do. And, don't sell yourself. Don't sell yourself short. So, even if it may not look like that you can't apply for it or you're not eligible, contact the program officer and give it a shot because you never know. Um, HHMI, like they were, they're known to be a, like a biomedical community, and there weren't any plant biologists that got the Hannah Gray Fellowship before me. But now there's there were two in my cohort. So, don't sell yourself short. <laughs> Yeah, good point. If I ask anything, um, start thinking about your poster project now and start reading application guidelines now. Uh, yeah, that's my, my advice. And I, I think that in addition to that, think about it as a bigger picture. Think about it as the next step in your career. And what are you going to need to, to do the things you want to do? What are you going to need to achieve your goals? And that will start to direct you to different individuals as mentors, different research directions. Just remember that this is about you and your research and, and what you do, you should be excited about. It's, there's not one... Um, area of science right now that is going to be more competitive than another. And in the fellowship programs, again, it is about the individual as opposed to the research. We're looking to invest in people. Okay. Awesome. All right. Well, thank you everyone for attending today. Um, if your question didn't get answered or you think of something later, we always encourage you to move this conversation to Twitter, tag us in your tweet or your questions. Um, we'll retweet them and try to sort of use the hive mind of the plant biology community and all of our Twitter followers to help get your questions answered. So thanks for attending everyone. Hope you have a good day. Thank you. Thanks.
Thanks.